Hello everyone, I'm David. I work for G Research, who are a originally UK-based company, but expanding in Dallas now. Um, I work on Kubernetes and related technologies in our open source division. Um, I'm here to talk about user namespaces in Kubernetes. But first of all, I just want to start off with a shell. So this is just a standard Linux command line no namespaces or anything going on here. I'm just logged into a Linux machine. Um, I've got a little exploit here. So what happens when I run it? Oh, I seem to be root. So yeah, OK, I'm root, right? Well, let's see. So what did that exploit actually do? It's not an exploit. All it actually did is create a user namespace and mapped the root user to my current username. So basically, the user ID that I'm logged in as becomes mapped to UID zero, so it appears to be root, but it's not really root. So this is what user namespaces gives you at a very basic level. Um, and I'm using the unshare command here, which is a very simple command that interfaces to the unshare system call, which is what is used underneath containers. So just to sort of look at that, um, Unshare does a lot of things, um, but if you scroll down a bit in the man page, it says somewhere, yep, it creates a user namespace. So, yeah, it creates a user namespace. So, user namespaces? Well, sure, I've sort of shown what they are at a very high level there. Um, there's a little bit more to them than that. Uh, but let's first of all just recap some container basics. So, when I'm talking about containers, I'm going to be talking about Linux containers. Obviously, there's Solaris zones, FreeBSD jails, and Windows containers as well, which Kubernetes does support Windows containers. It doesn't quite support any of the other technologies, although there are ways to build containers on top of some of them. Um, but we're not talking about that here. This is very, very definitely focused on a particular implementation of containers in Linux that supports user namespaces. So um, this is one of the things that containers are built out of on Linux. You've got namespaces, which isolate things. So you're probably familiar with things like the mount namespace, PID namespace, network namespace. Um, there's more than that, as I just showed in the unshare example, um, user namespaces being one of them. But there's also the UTS namespace, which covers what your host name is, among some other bits and pieces, the sort of miscellaneous things. Um, and then there's C groups as well as namespaces. So the way to think about it is namespaces isolate things, whereas C groups limit things. So C groups limit the amount of memory you can use, the amount of CPU you can use, and, and also things like IO bandwidth. And there's other things there, like in C groups version two, uh, C groups can limit the devices that you can access. Um, and it's associated with the C group, even though it's a little bit strange because it's sort of closer to the more isolation side rather than limiting, but you know, a lot of this comes down to just how it happened to be implemented in the kernel. Um, and actually, that's actually one of the tricky things about getting some of this right, is the interfaces are sometimes a little bit strange, often just because of quirks of implementation. Um, so we'll look at some examples of that in a moment. So this diagram is a rough example to sort of show how namespaces work. So within the kernel, a process is in a particular namespace, and then that process only sees that particular namespace. So for example, for the mount namespace, the process only sees those, those mounts that are in that namespace. But some of the namespaces, like the mount namespace in particular, are hierarchical. So if something is mounted in the mount namespace above it, depending how the namespace is set up, it may see the files above it. So you can, you can use a mount namespace to add particular files into the visibility of a process, but it can still see the processes, sorry, the, the mount points above that in the tree of um, namespaces, uh, whereas the PID namespace is not really hierarchical. Um, so why, why am I sort of going into the detail of that? Well, it's kind of interesting, and we can also demonstrate some of this. So here again, I'm using Unshare to demonstrate this. And by adding minus minus user there, I'm creating the user namespace. And as we see, we get another root shell. And we know now that this is not a root shell, really. 
but we've also created a PID namespace. So if we just look at what PID we have, well, we're process ID one. But actually, interestingly, if we ask for all the processes, it's like, oh, interesting, that's um, a huge list of processes. So what have I done here? Well, I haven't created a mount namespace. So if I add this option on the end, minus minus mount proc, then unshare will actually create a mount namespace as well. And if I do that, I'm still PID1. But if I do PSUX, I see just what's in my namespace here. So that's a little bit strange. We have to be a little bit careful with how we set up namespaces. Obviously, normally something like Docker or uh, if you're using Kubernetes, run C underneath it, uh, depending exactly what implementation you're using, is going to do that for you. So it's quite hard to get that wrong. But as we all see, there are ways that the underlying tools occasionally do get this wrong and create security issues. So um, let's close that. So um, I quite like this as a sort of comic example of what user namespaces are. This is from uh, Julia Evans with Wizard Zines, um, and she's got a whole series on uh, containers and what, they, what, what they're built out of. Um, and as you can see on one of the panels here, it says, but not all container runtimes use them. And so Kubernetes for a long time has not used user namespaces. It's been possible to enable them on Docker, but by default, most people don't, and they're often not used, which is a shame. Um, so what is a user namespace? Well, we have a PID namespace, which isolates PIDs, as I just showed you. Um, you get a totally new set of process IDs. And actually, user namespaces are more like a UID namespace. It lets you map one UID or a range of UIDs inside a container to a different range outside them. Um, now, not, you have to be root to map to anything other than your own user ID, but uh, the demo I just showed where I was only mapping a single user ID, so I was mapping my own user ID to root. Actually, any user on a Linux machine can do that if nothing else limits that. So there are interesting use cases here for sandboxing and um, some things like Chrome, for example, do actually try to use user namespaces in some of their sandboxing if they can. Um, there are slight complexities there, but um, I'm talking about Kubernetes, so I won't go into the details of how Chrome does sandboxing, but if you're interested, this is definitely a way of sandboxing things that means that if, for example, something runs with a different process, uh, sorry, user ID, then it can't, there's no way of even mapping to that other user ID, it will appear as nobody. Um, so it can't talk between two different user IDs even unexpectedly. So it's quite a nice form of hard sandboxing for user IDs, which if you actually think about how often, if you're following best practices, you run not as root with Docker or Kubernetes, you run as, you know, UID 1000 or whatever is the standard UID in your distribution usually. Um, but the issue there is actually, if you think about it, other containers running are also running as UID 1000. So following best practices, it turns out that actually you still may be running things as the same user ID on the host as far as it's concerned. And the isolation is provided by namespaces. But if, for example, something leaks between containers, then it's still possible that you could attack the other container from a, a partial ex container escape. Um, so user namespaces add an extra layer on top of that. So I haven't really talked about Kubernetes yet, but what's happening in Kubernetes? So user namespaces are now beta as of Kubernetes 1.30, which was released a month or so ago, I think. Um, and how does that work? Well, it's actually very simple. So, unfortunately, I can't see my mouse up here, but where it says host users up there, um, you just set host users false. So this follows the pattern of um, network, for example, where you say host network true, and the default is false. This is the other way around. So host users is defaulting to true because it's a new thing, and so it's always been that way around. Whereas if you think about host network, if you are running something that wants host network access, you say you want the host network, whereas user namespace is the other way around. But it is the same, it's the same mechanism, the same similar name. So it's not really very complicated. You, you turn a flag on, and that's it. So what does that look like? Well, I've got a thing running here. Hopefully it's running still. Yes, it is. 
so here I am. I'm inside a Kubernetes container with a user namespace. So I'm running this as root. Obviously, not necessarily best practices, but actually this is not running as user ID zero, user ID zero on the host. So um, if I look at this magic file, I can see what the UID map is. Um, and this, this is a file that serves two purposes. You can use it for debugging, but it's also the file that under the hood, um, the container runtime or whatever is setting up this container writes to to say what to map particular UIDs to. So here, it's chosen a very big number. You can see on the second column. Um, and then it's mapped a range of 65,000 user IDs to zero inside the container. So what the, what, the, what the three numbers are, are the UID inside the container to start at, the UID outside the container to start at, and the number of UIDs to map. So in this case, it's saying map z zero inside the container to that very big number, whatever that is. Can't really do that, but two, two billion or something. Um, map 65,000 users. So one, one thing that is a limiting factor with user namespaces is you only actually get 35,000 user ID, sorry, not 65,000 user IDs. Um, but generally that's enough for container usage unless you're doing something crazy. Um, in the past, on older Linux machines, that was how many you got anyway, and then the user ID was increased to 32 bit a very long time ago. Um, but user namespaces just carve up that existing range. Um, there is a potential future work going on in the kernel to actually expand the kernel's internal user ID to 64 bits so that containers could actually have a 32 bit range. Uh, but that would never be a, a particular user namespace, would never have more than. 32 bits worth of user ID, so that way it could actually be almost fully virtualized, as it were. You wouldn't, you, you could have something that wouldn't be visible from outside as a limiting factor. Um, but for now, this is not really a limiting factor. The only, the only thing that is slightly annoying is if you do want to create a user namespace within a user namespace, which is fine. You can nest them up to 16 times. Um, you can't, you, you lose some number of UIDs each time. Uh, assuming you don't want to map root inside the user namespace to the other root in the next user namespace. So you are probably going to lose at least one user ID each time you do that. Um, you can do tricks like carve out in the middle so that because nobody is normally 65,334, uh, you can keep that at the same UID range and then make some UID in the middle not work. Um, some of this may be supported better in later versions of Kubernetes. You can ask for more user IDs and things. Um, but for now, it's not a huge limiting factor anyway. So other than that sort of weird thing with user IDs, this is just totally like I'm inside a normal container um, running as root. Uh, I can actually do some things in here that I can't normally do inside a container. I can um, mount things I can, if I have the capabilities. Um, I'll get to that in a second. But for now, this is actually a more secure container than a normal container. So I did lie slightly. Um, so when I said that this is in beta, it's in beta in Kubernetes, but you actually need release candidate, release candidate versions of container D and run C at the moment, or you can use a release candidate version of container D and a release version of C run instead. But yeah, you, you generally have to mess around with a few versions to make this work. So this is actually the kind of config that I'm using to run this example on. Um, so it definitely does work. Um, and that image is actually a public image I pushed. So if you want to test this out, you can just you know, trust me and use that, use that image there. Um, so on the topic of trusting me, there was a bug in Run C. Um, this was made the news quite a lot sort of in February or so. Uh, people probably noticed it and hopefully patched. Um, so I thought I'd just demonstrate this. Um, so it's actually the world's simplest bug to exploit. The, the exploit here is, uh, if I can move my mouse again. Yeah, I've lost it, uh, there we go. Um, the exploit is there. So it leaks the file descriptor of a particular directory, which um, happens to be sysfsc group, but it doesn't really matter. It leaks something that is in the wrong mount namespace to the other mount namespace. So if we just check that this is working. Okay, so 
this is actually working, this is expected, this error message. So we're running a shell in a very strange way. Um, if we ask it where the shell is, it says it doesn't know where it is today. Um, but if we ask it what's in the directory, well, we see some stuff. And you might notice if you look closely, there's some weird sys fuse things and some kernel stuff, which we wouldn't expect normally to be in the C groups inside a container. So what is this? Well, simple to answer that. If we just go a few levels up, it gives an error message. If we ask it what the working directory is, again, it tells us it's some dots, which is a bit strange. But if we type ls, uh, we, we seem to be on a root file system. Um, and so then we can just do something simple like uh, that. And then if we just close this, and so I'm running this inside kind. So if I do then uh, docker exec and the, the name of the container that the Kubernetes node is running in is vul vulnerable control plane. Um, so then if I just run bash here, uh, it says owned before it gives me a prompt. So I have injected something from a container to the host in possibly one of the more trivial uh, container escapes ever. So if you haven't patched run C, you probably should. Um, but the interesting thing there is why is that possible? Well, that's possible because my user ID, user ID zero within the container is the same as the user ID zero outside the container. So if anything like a file descriptor leaks from one context to another, then you can use that file descriptor to, well, do anything that root can because there's nothing limiting what root can do inside a container. If you're using user namespaces, um, it turns out that it's not even possible. Actually, it fails, I won't demo it, but it fails to run the container in most cases because it tries to CD to the directory and it just can't, it can't get there um, because it tries to do a MKDIR for reasons. Um, it possibly is possible to get further than that, but you might be able to get read-only access, but you definitely can't get write access um, with this. So user namespaces limit pretty much the damage that can be done to just an arbitrary read rather than an arbitrary write. Um, so, how are we doing for time? Okay, so why, why now? Why, why use a namespace support now? You know, actually user namespaces have been in the kernel for 10 years or so. Um, so, ID mapped mounts is the reason for this. So, ID mapped mounts are a feature that was added in 2020 to Linux. Um, but each file system needs some extra support. So um, over time, file systems are gaining support. And uh, Rodrigo Campos, who did some of the work for the Kubernetes support, actually added support for tempfs in Linux 6.3. And so that's the minimum version of Linux that you need for Kubernetes to work with user namespaces. Um, conveniently, that the version in Ubuntu 24.04, which is the LTS version of Ubuntu, is recent enough that it has a newer kernel than that. So one way is run Ubuntu, depending uh, what, what distribution you use. I'm not sure if Red Hat have backported it yet. There was some talk that they might. I haven't kept up on that. Um, sorry, 24.04 is the Ubuntu version. So the, the latest LTS. So it should be something if you're using Ubuntu that you upgrade to anyway. So it's not, it's not a special version. Um, so ID mapped mounts is basically using the UID mapping that I showed you for file systems as well. That didn't exist before. Before, if you created a user namespace, you just saw the IDs that the, the files had outside the container if they mapped to an ID inside the container. Otherwise, you saw them owned by nobody. So files that were owned by root outside of the um, container would just show as owned by nobody, which wasn't very helpful. Um, and this is a totally different me mechanism to NFS ID mapping, if you're familiar with that. This is a sort of internal kernel only thing, rather than something that is done over the wire or things like NFS is. Um, actually, there's no support yet for NFS ID mapping. That's a different complex thing. Um, so to try and explain this a little bit, um, when you write the file, you write something like 013 to the magic UID map file. Um, I'm simplifying here, you actually can't always echo to it, because it has to be a single write that does it. But um, 
anyway, for avoiding simplification, basically you may have fewer IDs inside the container. So here I've got zero on the bottom left is root on the host, and so actually root in the container is mapped to UID one outside of the container. So fairly simple. Normally it would be a much larger number than that, but possibly using smaller numbers makes it easier to understand. Um, and you can actually nest these further, so that's what I was sort of saying, that you could, you could have a range of UIDs, and then you'd have a smaller range of UIDs, and go on with that. A um, little bit of a pain to set up, but there are, there are reasons that you might want to do that. Um, so, since Kubernetes 128, this has been supported, called stateful container support. So it means that volumes and other things were supported with user namespaces. Before that, if you wanted to use user namespaces, you had to either not have volumes, or the other option was to use Cryo, which supported user namespaces via a separate annotation rather than the built-in support. Um, so if your workload can run in the restricted pod security standards, you can basically just add host users false once this has become GA and we've, all the other versions of things are new enough. Um, so that's a thing that hopefully people will just start doing soon. You know, if you're not doing anything special that needs any special access, this should just work. Um, it's a standard Unix interface, right? Nothing looks any stranger than anything else in a container at that point. Um, so, where can we go from here? So, I mentioned that we have root inside the container, and that root is a more capable, in some ways, root than root outside the container. It is possible to do something like this. So, this is from the GitLab docs, which says that you should run your runners as privileged true. Um, that allows the Docker, kind of Docker in Docker image to run Docker commands. It also allows the image to totally escape anything and basically do what it likes, but that's one way to deal with the problem. Um, but a better way is understanding how capabilities work and user namespaces. So again, I'm just gonna run a little prompt here. So we can see inside this user namespace, we actually have some capabilities, and that is a bit of a hard output to read, but you can do This. So the, the effective capabilities are um, this, and if I, I won't decode it, but if we decode it, that is essentially all the capabilities in that list up there. So you'll see that is a lot of capabilities. Um, but actually that doesn't matter because the kernel understands that you're in a user namespace and it only asks about capabilities in the right namespace where they matter. So some of these, for example, sys module. Well, you can only load a module in the host or initial user namespace. So it doesn't matter what, whether you've got this module in a container because it won't do anything, which is very different to how it currently works with a privileged container where it will definitely be able to mess with kernel modules and do all sorts. So this is kind of neat because it means that um, we can do this. So in the Docker source code is the list of the default capabilities it wants, so to make, make it so that people don't have to configure anything strange for Docker. Um, we can put this list, so it's got Capsys admin in there and some other things. Um, there's also another thing in here called proc mount unmasked, which means that it doesn't mount something over proc slash sys, to, which is normally needed to stop someone writing to sys controls and things. Um, Again, the kernel understands that you're in a user namespace and that you shouldn't have permission to do that, so it's safe to do that. There are a couple of extra information leaks that come up, but the worst I can find is someone complained that someone could figure out if they were playing sound on their desktop if they were also running Kubernetes, so there's not actually like any serious security issues there. Um, and so this is probably going to become a, a thing that people can make use of. Um, that, that particular feature has actually been stuck in alpha in Kubernetes for two or possibly more years. Um, it's now hopefully coming out of alpha, um, and it just makes it easier to do this. It turns out it doesn't actually matter if you have this feature or not, but because, because you have Capsys admin inside the uh, container, you can just unmount things anyway. Um, so it's a bit of a confusing thing. 
Um, but currently, to run Docker needs Cryo because there's one extra feature that we don't have in Kubernetes itself and in Container D. So um, how, how this works is when Cryo sees sbin init as the entry point that is being run, it does some extra tricks to set up the C groups to be owned by the user ID inside the container. Um, so somewhere here, I've got already running, I've got a docker test. So if I just go into this, uh, looks like docker test. So hopefully this has worked. So here I have a sleep infinity running inside this. So like I showed before, this is just a user ID, user, user name spaced container. Um, it's running as root. It's running on cryo for this, this example, just because as I said, the C group needs to be owned by the right um, user, which cryo does automatically. Um, it should be possible very soon for container D to do that, whether through a add-on or we get that into Kubernetes itself, I'm not sure. Um, so while I'm here, I'll just run something again. Uh, Alpine. Yeah, okay, so now, now there's two things running inside that. So you can see Docker, Docker just works. Um, and if I now go back onto the host, um, so we can see a lot of things here. Um, somewhere, hopefully in this output, we should see, you can see Docker running here and in the middle, I can see there's a sleep infinity and a sleep 4242. So this, this cryoscope here is actually the cryoscope that has been created for the container. And then we're running system D inside that container. Um, and basically within that, we then have container D running, which Docker has run for us. And we then have some Docker scopes that have been created. And you can see those would be running Alpine, but because we just ran directly run sleep. We don't see an init or anything inside them. We just see the commands. But as you can see here, this is correctly nesting C groups and things so that actually we can run Docker within Docker without having a privileged container or any of the other things that um, might be needed for that. So what does the Docker file for this look like? Well, it's as simple as this. We install Docker and systemd and set the entry point to slash sbin init, which if you compare that to the Docker Docker in Docker image is considerably simpler and much easier to reason about. It's just a standard Linux setup, really. You're running system D, and when you install a component, system D is set to start it automatically, so you don't even have to think about it. It just works, which is quite nice and hopefully makes things much easier. Um, there's various issues with the Docker in Docker image itself, other than that people mostly run it as privileged. Um, I think actually the Docker and Docker image would probably work inside this environment. I've not tested, but uh, no reason it wouldn't. Um, one issue though is that Docker needs IP tables and IP tables needs CapNet admin. And CapNet admin has some issues. So that was one of them. That was in 2022. Um, more recently, there was this one. So do we actually want to give people um, the ability to run stuff with CapNet admin? Well, you don't have to give CapNet admin. You can potentially use something like Podman with user space networking, but it still probably is possible to exploit that. You still need to allow, inside one of the containers, you need to allow some level of network configuration which needs net admin. So it's sort of unavoidable. So, um, it's, it's avoided in normal containers, which aren't trying to run Docker or do anything crazy, because the setcom pol policy blocks the clone system call and the unshare system call when it tries to create a namespace. Um, but we won't allow it, so I didn't show that actually, but we use a setcom policy that doesn't filter anything. Um, so what's the answer? So this is Tetragon. Um, Tetragon is from Isovalent, who also makes Cilium, and it it works with Cilium, but can also be used on its own. 
and it can use eBPF to filter various things. So this is a policy that somewhere up here, it's got a system call, so it filters the socket system call uh, somewhere there. Um, and it looks for arguments of AF netlink with SockRaw and netlink netfilter. Um, so what, what, does that, what does that mean? Well, so when, when you want to talk to IP tables, the, the program that is trying to talk to it will call the socket system call with those arguments. Oops. Um, and down here, you'll see that what I've actually done in this policy is I've allowed it or if it's not, if it's, so if it's not IP tables itself, then it's not allowed. Um, actually, you also need to allow Docker. There's also obviously an issue with this, which is if someone knows that this is the policy, they can just replace the IP tables binary with their uh, exploit and it will still work. Um, there are some features in Cilium possibly upcoming that allow you to do some kind of hashing of binaries so that um, you, can, you can make sure that only certain binaries are allowed, but that's a bit harder to set up. Um, but the point is this does begin to give you a way to at least audit what people are doing inside user namespaces and maybe, maybe do something that would block some exploits, at least the, you know, the really obvious, someone downloads the exploit and runs it directly rather than modifying it. Um, so it's still not great, but you know, that's partly the cost of flexibility, right? Um, so one interesting thing here is that Ubuntu 24.04 added a restricted mode for user namespaces so that if you're an unprivileged user, the demo I was just doing where I did unshare, that doesn't work on Ubuntu anymore, which also means that exploits work like the Settlers of Netlink one and the other one won't work, which is good. Um, it turns out actually this is not applicable in our case because usually what's happening is Kubelet is running as the root user, so it's not unprivileged, and then it's creating a user namespace. So it can still do that. But the problem is that that still means someone has a user namespace that if you give them the CapNet admin capability in, they are still capable to exploit the machine based on that. So um, that's possibly helping in one respect, but not really in the Kubernetes respect. Um, other than Tetragon or other eBPF-based filterings, I don't really have any good ideas other than maybe we can you know, filter the kernel a bit more, but uh, that's a different discussion. So other options are GVisor, um, but GVisor lets you run workloads in a sandbox, and it does that by, there was a talk earlier uh, yesterday, and one of the things that it won't do is it won't give you enough system call surface to run the whole of Docker. It, I don't think they're probably ever gonna target that, I have to ask them, but uh, it seems unlikely that they would try to implement the whole of IP tables in user space. I would be surprised anyway. Um, the better option is to use something like Kata Containers, which is a virtual machine of some kind that is run as a container. Um, and in many ways, if you actually want real proper sandboxing, that is the better option if you also want to be able to run you know, Docker-like workloads or more capable workloads. So if you want to use that, I would really recommend that. The issue is actually the things I showed you with eBPF and Tetragram, that won't work because it's a kernel inside the other kernels, so it's actually harder in some ways to get visibility into it. But the, the big one is the performance isn't as good because, for example, a block device is going out of Kata and in again. Um, there's some optimizations there, but none of them are quite as fast as directly running on the host itself. So as usual, it's a trade-off with security, and at least for the use cases that we're using them for, we quite like user namespaces because it gives us a little bit more capability um, and maybe some slightly better security than you know, directly running privileged things or other options like that. Um, so yeah, in summary, if you can, try using namespaces and give some feedback on the beta. Um, like I said, you may need to install release candidate versions of things right now. Uh, that should soon be released, but I can't speak for projects as to when they will release things. Um, hopefully in the future, that actually if you can use user namespaces, so if you're 
workload can run in the restrictive path security standards, you should be able to use them. If it needs privileges, but not host level privileges, you should be able to use them. Uh, but if not, maybe cat containers is the answer there. Else, I'm curious what use case you have that doesn't work here. There are some. So for example, components like Cilium's agent, which needs to configure the host networking, clearly can't run in anything other than the host network namespace, which means it can't run in a user namespace. Um, so that would, that would be, you know what you're doing, so don't use user namespaces. But other than sort of system level components like that, possibly some monitoring systems might need to not run in user namespaces, but nearly everything, it would be a few components running outside of them, and then they should just become the default. So that's all I have. Um, there's some links there, so Rodrigo and the other people who worked on the uh, user namespace support in Kubernetes wrote a blog post. Um, I helped a tiny bit, but not very much. Um, and there's also a historical article there from Netflix, which is very interesting, because they, they, they are internally using a different container runtime of their own, um, but they kicked off some of the work to get this in, integrated in Kubernetes, so a lot of that is what I said in this talk, but there's some interesting background there as well. Um, and yeah, that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> and any questions if you've got them? Does it need to have one for Kubernetes and Kubernetes? Yes, it does. Um, it needs a patch. I've got a patch that needs to actually get cleaned up. Um, there's a detail there that sysfs is usually mounted read-only. Inside a user namespace, it's actually safe to write it read-write. Um, sorry, mount it read-write. But that's not yet um, ready, and it certainly probably won't be an upstream Kubernetes for a long time, if at all. It's currently available. The patch I've done is an annotation for Cryo. Um, we're actually using that internally, and I think people have run Kubernetes on Kubernetes for testing things. Um, I, yeah, it's a bit crazy, but I do, I don't have it handy, but I do have a screenshot somewhere of what I showed with system, system D with nested, nested, nested. So you get like three levels of nesting. So it's kind of crazy and fun. But like I said, you can nest this up to 16 times. So give people the tools and they'll do crazy things. <laughs> what, the, wouldn't that cause havoc with scratches? Um, I mean, if you were doing something serious, but this is mostly for testing purposes, so I don't think, like if you actually want to run Kubernetes in Kubernetes and do clusters differently, there's, there's other ways that would probably be better than doing this. This is, this, is more for, this is more for I want to run a kind cluster inside my Kubernetes cluster for testing things, and then I can have Kubernetes everywhere, but I mean, Kubernetes themselves use kind for testing Kubernetes on Kubernetes, but I think they're doing that by just setting privileged because they trust the infrastructure. But if you don't necessarily trust your users as much or whatever, then this is the way to do it. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, so the question was, would this be part of the restricted pod security standards eventually? I, I hope so. Um, there was some talk of actually having like an intermediate pod security standard that allowed some of the extra things that user namespaces allowed you to do. I don't know if that one's gonna happen. There was, there was some pushback on that. But yeah, I think eventually making it part of the pod security standards would be great. The problem with that is Kubernetes supports back to quite old Linux kernels, and so making it officially part of the pod security standards would limit the kernel support to a very recent kernel. Um, and Kubernetes is still putting back to four point something. So it would probably be like five years in the future just because of you know, cycles and timelines for long-term support and things that when that would actually happen. Yeah, another question. Um, so for a long time, the risk was that it would break things because the ID mapping wasn't there for fil files. Actually, the ID mapping for files is still the riskiest part because even if you have root inside a user namespace, if you create a file, the ID mapping means it goes back to being owned by root on the actual host itself. 
Um, that's mostly fine because you shouldn't be able to access the files because permissions restrict them, but it does mean if you have a set UID binary, it still actually somehow ends up as owned by root on the host. So there are potential escape scenarios there. Um, yeah. Any more? No, okay, thank you very much everyone.